Hello, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to today's webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GADP. My name is Astrid pins and I'm hosting today's session on susceptibility testing in antibacterial drug R&D. This webinar is part of GADP's education and outreach activities. And all our webinars are recorded and hosted on, the web, on our website, revive.grp.org slash webinars. On our website, you can also find other types of content, such as our antimicrobial viewpoint series and the antimicrobial encyclopedia. This is a growing resource with, which currently contains about 200 terms um, relevant to antimicrobial R&D. Uh, for our webinar today, uh, we will have two presentations followed by one Q&A session. You can send your questions at any time during the webinar by adding them in the questions window in the webinar control panel. And at the end, we will do our best to address as many questions as possible. Uh, please include the name of the speaker uh, to who you address your question. So now I have the pleasure to introduce today's panel. Our first speaker will be Dee Shortridge who is a senior, director, a senior director at JMI Laboratories. And our second speaker is Rafael Canton uh, from the U Hospital Universitario Ramon y Cajal in Madrid, Spain. Our moderator today is Christian Giske. Christian is a professor in bacteriology and head of division of clinical microbiology at the Department of Laboratory Medicine at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. He's also a chief physician in bacteriology and mycology at the Karolinska University Hospital, where he leads a research group conducting translational research in antimicrobial resistance. Christian is also the chair of the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing. Welcome, Christian. I would I invite you now to switch on your webcam and your microphone, please. And then you can introduce our first speaker, Dee Shortridge. Many thanks for the introduction. Um, um, with this, I would like to then introduce uh, the first speaker today, Dee Shortridge, as um, uh, already outlined. Uh, Dee Shortridge is a Senior Director for Microbiology and Diagnostics at JMI Laboratories. She is responsible for overseeing uh, new antibiotic development, surveillance projects, and diagnostic device development. And before coming to JMI Labs, she was a director of R&D microbiology at Biomario, and she has been working on development of ID and AST products for Vitec 2 systems, amongst other things. And she has also been working uh, previously for Abbott Laboratories with clinical development of several antimicrobials. I am now very happy to welcome Dee. Uh, please start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, here at JMI, Len Duncan, helped in preparation of this presentation. This is, these are the labs that JMI was con contracted to perform services for in 2022. In this talk, we'll discuss the in vitro testing of preclinical compounds. In vitro testing of preclinical compounds is used to determine the activity of a compound against the species of interest and compare activities between compounds within a series and within other drug classes. It's used to correlate the in vitro activity with in vivo models and possible PKPD targets. I will discuss determining the MIC values for preclinical lead compounds and developing a susceptibility testing method as the compound advances. I will not discuss animal or PKPD modeling or breakpoint setting. MIC testing for a preclinical candidate should use standard cation adjusted Mueller Hinton broth first. MHB is the most widely used and accessible testing media. It's indicated by CLSI, UCAST, and ISO. Calcium and magnesium levels are maintained at a defined range by the manufacturers. Broth microdilution is the preferred method because it's the most adaptable to the lab setting 
although broth macro dilution and auger dilution are also options. MHB supports the growth of most non-fastidious species of interest. When testing fastidious species, such as streptococci, supplementation with lysed horse blood is needed, and anaerobes or other special organisms use different media. If your compound has lower than expected activity with this method, that's a challenge. And in order to understand that, you need to understand your compound's characteristics. First step is solubility. Is your compound soluble in a solvent at a sufficient level for MIC testing? Standard working stock is 1,280 mg per liter. The typical testing range is 32 to 0.015, depending on the activity of your compound. Testing below 0.001 mg per liter may generate some reproducibility issues, and testing above 256 mg per liter may um, cause some precipitation issues. Another thing to understand is whether your compound is a neutral or salt form, which are important when determining purity and potency of the compound. You can assess solubility by centrifugation or analytical chemistry or spectroscopy. Consider that your compound may precipitate but may not be visible by eye. And sometimes we have seen precipitation at higher concentrations in an MIC test, and this is noted by seeing reappearing growth. DMSO is the standard research solvent. The final concentration of DMSO in MIC tests cannot exceed 1%. It's useful to determine early if another solvent would work. The best solvents are water and phosphate buffer. Determine if additional tricks are needed to get your compound in a solution. Heat, pH adjustment, sonication. It's useful to develop directions on how to solubilize and so that that can be um, consistently done both internally and externally in testing. The next is to test the medium stability of your compound in MHB. It's important to test the stability of the working stock in the 1280 mg per liter concentration. Compare freshly prepared working stock with stock that was stored overnight or at minus 80 degrees. Determine the MICs of standard ATCC strains, freshly made medium, and medium that was made a over a week prior and stored at four degrees should be compared. Look at activity in freshly made panels, as well as panels frozen overnight at minus 80, which contain um, the diluted compound and mueller hitten broth at the required concentrations. Determine panel uh, stability. The panels can be tested weekly, after, stored at minus 80, and then tested weekly for four weeks. Test panels, panels can then be tested monthly for six to nine months. And it's useful to graph the MICs versus time and look for trends here. If the compound will be combined with another agent, you should test the combination working stock together at the concentrations that are desired. Look at both fresh and frozen stocks, and then in combination with the media, both fresh and frozen, at the relevant concentrations. Don't assume that the combination will be compatible just because each compound alone is stable. It's possible for a beta-lactamase inhibitor to bind to the beta-lactam that it is combined uh, with, for instance. Determine the spec spectrum of activity of your compound. You should look at both target and non-target organisms, gram-negative species as well as gram-positive species. Determine the activity of the compound against multiple isolates per species. If the initial testing was on stock isolates, it's important to use clinical isolates next. 10 isolates per species is okay, but 100 is better to determine the consistency of the activity of your compound. You should look at the MIC range by genera and by species. 
FDA guidance asks for more than 100 isolates per key species collected within the last three years. And usually much larger isolate sets are tested. Isolates should represent both wild type and common resistant phenotypes. If available, you should test molecularly characterized isolates with common resistance mechanisms. You should see if the MIC range varies with isolates resistant to other drug classes. You should always include the CLSI UCAS QC isolates with each MIC run to begin collecting QC data on your compound. Include a relevant comparator with QC ranges in each run to ensure that the panels were made and are performing correctly. The comparator should be of the same or related class if that's possible. If that's not possible, then use a commonly uh, used antimicrobial that's active against the target organisms and has QC ranges. It's also important to look at various variables on the in vitro MIC test. The purpose is to study the common variables and to see what their effect on your compound's MIC values are. This will help you understand how robust your MIC test is. Standard method that you would compare to is MHB broth microdilution testing in triplicate. Method variations include inoculum, low standard and high inoculum, incubation atmospheres, ambient CO2, et cetera, and incubation time. 18 to 20 is the standard, so 16 or 24. Depending on your compound, you could go longer than 24. It's also useful to compare broth, microdilution, and auger dilution. For pH, low standard and high pH is important to determine. Macrolides have less activity at the lower pH. I, I have the wrong word there. Look at calcium and magnesium concentrations versus the standard uh, concentration in Mueller Hinton broth. Calcium is um, 20 to 25 mg per liter. Magnesium is 10 to 12 and a half mg per liter. So look at lower and higher concentrations than that. It's useful to look at the effect of other cations depending on the chemical class and the mode of action, such as iron for a siderophore um, bound compound. The addition of polysorbate 80 should be looked at. And for the Mueller Hinton broth, MIC values can vary between MHB manufacturers. So it's important to compare at least three different MHB sources if possible. MHB must, that you use must meet the ISO criteria for use in susceptibility testing. And you can find that out from the manufacturer. Other thing to test is activity in biological fluids. The compound activity should be examined in pooled human serum, both heat inactivated and non-heat inactivated. Activity will reflect the compound's protein binding. Look at bovine lung surfactant, which is the surrogate for human lung epithelial lining fluid, which is important if you're going to um, treat pneumonia as an indication with your drug. Daptomycin against Staph aureus should be run as a control as it lacks activity in bovine surfactant. Activity in port mucin can be of interest for large molecules. Use colistin as a control. It has decreased activity in 2% porcine mucin. Lysed horse blood addition should be looked at since this is the standard medium additive for fastidious organisms. And pooled human urine is useful if the goal is to treat urinary tract infections. To review, the goal here is to show that your compound's activity is not impacted by these fluids. If MICs are more than two doubling dilutions higher or lower, additional studies can be performed to determine the reason. So if your compound has more activity in non-standard media, do you develop your susceptibility test in that medium? Some questions to answer. 
is the MIC difference greater than the plus or minus one doubling dilution variation of the method? What difference in MIC values do you see to your drug with a panel of isolates with known MICs as well as on a larger set of wild type isolates? What percentage of these isolates show the effect in non-standard medium? And does the lower MIC correlate much better with the in vivo PKPD targets? If you see a higher MIC, binding to plastic panels may be an issue with larger molecules. Does polysorbate 80 lower the MIC values? Compare glass tubes, polypropylene panels, and polystyrene panels for MIC testing to determine if that's what's going on. Using a non-standard method for your susceptibility test will add complexity and cost to your development. Avoid when it's possible. And you should not use a, an alternate method just to increase the in vitro potency of your compound. An alternate method may delay getting your compound on AST device menus, and it may delay adoption of testing by clinical laboratories. You should discuss with CLSI and UCAST early on if you're thinking about using a non-standard medium. These are some drugs that are uh, use non-standard medium. Ceftericol requires iron depleted cation adjusted Mueller-Hinton broth. Daptomycin requires additional calcium. Phosphomycin and nixilinam uh, use auger dilution. Lipoglycopeptides use the addition of P80. Televancin originally developed their method without P80 but then what the method was revised after they were approved, which also required revision of the breakpoints. Oxacillin requires 2% sodium chloride. Polymyxin, originally uh, the method used P80, but it's since been reversed to omit P80. And tigacycline requires fresh medium. So what about disdiffusion? Overall, it's a useful qualitative test method for antimicrobials in a clinical setting. It does not work for large molecules like polymyxins or vancomycin. Determine if your compound is compatible with disdiffusion first. Will it diffuse through agar? Is it stable to drying on a paper disc? To answer these questions, do an early disc pilot with isolates that have known MIC values, both low and high. Make discs with a range of concentrations based on other agents in related classes, and then correlate the uh, zone of inhibition around the disc with the MIC. And the point is to determine if there is a concentration that differentiates isolates with low MICs from isolates with high MICs. And keep in mind that formal disc development will be done through the CLSI US work, UCAST working group. When your compound's ready to move from preclinical to clinical, plan when to go to CLSI and UCAST with your compound and your proposed method. CLSI M23 describes the information that's required by CLSI. You need the completed studies that we've discussed here and others. Begin discussions earlier if you have a non-standard method. Begin planning QC studies for the broth microdilution and disdiffusion. And remember, changes to the standard method must be accepted by CLSI and UCAST. And US FDA will also need to be aware of proposed changes. And you'll require the preliminary QC ranges prior to beginning clinical trials. So when to think about commercial AST? You should consider it if your antimicrobial will be used to treat infections caused by resistant bacterial pathogens, particularly in a hospital setting. I mean, among the devices, disc diffusion would be the first, and then other in vitro devices, such as automated systems or gradient strips. Remember that development time varies and can be three to four years or more, depending on the manufacturer. 
so approaching them earlier is definitely better. Requirements for solvent solubility and stability of your compound vary by manufacturer. It will require that you have a reference AST method with QC ranges. If you have a non-standard method, more time will be required to determine if your compound is compatible with the system. In conclusion, to develop the reproducible susceptibility test, you need to understand your compound's characteristics mode of action, solubility, spectrum of activity, solvent, and stability. And it's important to start the following studies earlier is always better. External MIC testing to determine if there is in uh, between lab variability, MHB comparisons, disk development, and the M23 QC studies. My final points, the goal is to make MIC testing with your compound as easy and reproducible as possible. When determining the MIC values, you should always start with mueller hinton broth. If in vitro activity with the reference broth doesn't correlate with in vivo, then you need to do the MIC method variation studies and uh, the biologic fluid studies to help understand why. An alternate method is an option, but it should be the last option. The test should clearly and cleanly identify susceptible versus resistant isolates. If MIC endpoints are less than clear cut to read, develop reading guidelines with photos early. Discuss how to read endpoint with external experts such as 80% inhibition versus substantial reduction, and discuss these endpoints with CLSI and UCAS. And there's a list of useful references, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Dee, for this very concise and nice talk on this subject. Um, we will then proceed uh, with the second presentation. The, the, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rafael Canton, who is the head of microbiology department at the Ramon y Cajal Hospital, and he's also an associate professor of clinical microbiology at the Complutense University in Madrid, Spain. Uh, Rafael's research work um, focuses on antimicrobial resistance mechanisms, new methods to study antimicrobial susceptibility and chronic respiratory infections. He is also currently the clinical data coordinator of UCAST and he belongs to the advisory committee of the JPI AMR and he is the president of the Spanish Society of Infectious Diseases and Clinical Microbiology. Uh, welcome, Rafael. Please start your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Christian, for this presentation. And I would like to thank also to Astrid and the GARP uh, initiative to invite me to this uh, this presentation. Also, I'm very happy to share this one with uh, these shorties. Uh, the title of my of my presentation, it will be related to the Pit Palace of an Opportunity of Sustainability Testing in Research and Development and clinical trial of new antibiotics, but just focusing in why is MIG needed in all this process of developing the new antimicrobials. Uh, here you can see, well, my acknowledgement and also my disclosure, which are similar the same. Uh, I participated in the IME initiative in the ENABLE project, which was important just to understand how was development, developed the uh, new antimicrobials and also how was uh, the process, just yes, when you have a, a good compound to be developed and later to be introduced in the clinic. But also, as Christian said, I belong to the UCAS co committee where I have been from, uh, let's say 15 years now, and uh, the process of understanding the MIC's uh, value on the development of the antimicrobial is discussed. I will not enter also in the breakpoints uh, useful or in the breakpoint uh, development uh, for the new compounds. So here you have a cartoon. This is taken for a, a review from Diarmi Hughes and also from Carlin. And here you can see when you have a, a compound that is later declared as a heat uh, compound, that's mean 
that this is an interesting compounds to be developed and later during this process uh, the, the, there are the first phases just to understand which is the target of this antimicrobial how is the activity and in this activity we are uh, understanding this because we are measure the MICs later uh, there is a process for the lead uh, to candidate declaration and after that there is also the preclinical development and entering the new compounds the new antimicrobial in the different phases phase one phase two phase three I later and later the, the approval uh, for marketing and the introduction the introduction for the for the patients but in all this process in all this process we need to measure the activity of these compounds and here the reference value for that is the MIC. The MIC, as uh, we previously learned with the with the, the uh, presentation, is uh, uh, that there is uh, an agreement in between the different agencies, the different body, bodies of decision. Uh, there is a standard uh, ISO uh, document uh, just defining how we have to calculate in the laboratory the MIC. The reference method is the broad micro dilution. In some occasion, as we learned previously, we are using the agar dilution, but this is the, the broad uh, micro dilution, which is the reference methods. And this is used as a reference method also for the breakpoint committee, UCAS, and also the CLSI. The MIC, which is reflecting, is the activity of the drug under a specific or standardized uh, test condition, and is used uh, for the Guide, guide of the clinician to use antimicrobial. Here we also need the breakpoints to translate these values, the MICs, into different categories, susceptible, susceptible implicit exposure or intermediate by the CLSI and also resistant. Also, uh, an important part is just to define the epidemiological cut of values. These are beyond the clinical breakpoints because here we can recognize which microorganisms has uh, an acquired resistant mechanism to differentiate that to that one that belongs to the wild type population, those that do not have a resistant mechanism. Also, we can compare the activity of different antimicrobials, including these new antimicrobials in the development of them. Also, in the susceptibility and resistance surveillance studies in the preclinical development, and also in the post marketing authorization. This is a very, very important to know how is the resistance developed by the microorganisms and also to understand the increases of the maintenance of the activity of the of the compounds and also as previously said by the we need also this uh, this value the MICs just to calibrate any other alternative methods including the disdiffusion the gradient test and even the automatic susceptibility testing that are used in the clinical microbiological laboratories and also it's, it's important to use this is a reference method we are trying to use to introduce a new rapid system either based in the, in the uh, rapid uh, microscopy in calorimetrics or in another method uh, flow cytometry that are uh, in development uh, nowadays for using directly from uh, the different uh, different uh, samples including for instance the blood culture but i would like just to focus your attention that the mic is also the reference values of an in vitro activity in the drug discovery and also in the clinical trials so when we have an antimicrobial that we think this is a good compound this is what we call a hit we have to know which is the uh, activity of this compound we are using the MIC, which is defined as a minimum inhibitory concentration. Here we measure the inhibition of growth. It's clear that we are using a bacteriostatic effect as uh, the MIC is read by the NACET-8 rather than the killing effect. We are not measure the bactericidal effect. We are measuring the bacteriostatic effect. If we have a, a compound that we think is a, an antimicrobial heat, normally uh, we select seven to eight uh, isolates that can define which is the activity of these microorganisms we can include gram negatives also we can include gram positives that are used as a biosensor of the initial uh, activity just to define which is the antibacterial spectrum and also the potencies and also normally there are some other microorganisms including for instance the hyper susceptible strains for instance, some E. coli that are defected in some, uh, some genes that are related with the effluent spams, just to be sure 
that activity of this compound is is adequate as not as as are not influenced by for instance permeability effect that avoid the entry of the compound in the bacteria normally there is a magic number the magic number is one microgram per ml which is considered the optimal activity of a compound if it is below this one microgram per ml is better if it is very high to this one microgram per ml for instance 32 or 64 uh, we have to do some efforts to demonstrate that this uh, this antibiotic is uh, affecting the growth of the microorganism or is interacting interacting with the target that is expected to have this microorganism also the MICs is uh, used uh, to uh, compare the activity of the compound to different collection of microorganisms normally is selected contemporary isolates to calculate for instance the MIC19 and also to calculate the epidemiological cutoff value of the ECV in the CLSI nomenclature here you can see some examples uh, i have just choose, chosen uh, three different examples that has been published recently for instance, this is a compound that is uh, named as a conjugate oligoelectrolyte. There are amphipilic molecules that share in a modular structure that spontaneously interact with the lipid layers. And I want you to focus the attention of the compound that is uh, selected in this uh, publication. And you can see that when it's te tested against some gram negatives, but also some gram positive, normally the uh, MICs that appear to this compound is one microgram per ml. In some occasion, the MIC is higher to this one microgram per ml. Here we have another example. This is the texobactin. This is a desipeptide that inhibits the cell wall synthesis. And here this compound is bactericidal. And you can see also here that the MIC is much lower than the one that we previously saw. But here you can see also that to know exactly the activity of this compound, we need to test with some uh, additional compound, which is the polysorbate, to avoid the plastic binding when we are uh, studying the activity of these compounds. I will come later to this concept. Also, we have here another compound. It has a very nice, uh, very nice name, which is the irresistin, the irresistin 16. This is a derivative of a compound that was declared, declared as a lead compound, which has a dual mechanism of action. It's a similar activity like trimetropine uh, with an interaction with folate metabolins. But interestingly, this compound is also uh, acting to the membrane potential of the bacteria. And because of this dual activity, probably this is the reason why the activity of this compound are so uh, so uh, low when we are trying to understand the potency, the quantity of the antibiotic that we need to inhibit the growth of the microorganisms. Here you can see different uh, gram positives and different gram negatives, and uh, the MIC is lower than one microgram per ml, or even slightly higher than this one microgram per ml. Here you can see just taking uh, in a different examples that we have in uh, in our web page that the one microgram per ml is a desirable uh, value that we need uh, just uh, final to have the activity of these compounds. But this is not, of course, in all the, all the antibiotics. I just take this, uh, these examples. This is temocillin and also E. coli. Imagine that we are using this uh, compound by uh, urinary tract infection. It concentrates in the urine. And here, it is not so important to have this very low MIC to inhibit the growth of the microorganisms. The echo here is 60 milligrams per ml, and the mode here is 4 micrograms per ml. In the right side of the slide, you have, uh, for instance, the linezolid and also the Staphylococcus aureus. And here you can see the echo is 4 micrograms per ml. And again, here, the mode of the MIC is 2 micrograms per ml, which is slightly higher to this 1 micrograms per ml that normally is supposed to uh, to be a number for the development of this new antimicrobial agent. Here you have the contrary. Here we have uh, two examples of E. coli and meropenem. Here the echo is 0.06 milligrams per ml. In the red color, you have the resistant isolates with different, for instance, carbapenemases. And in, in the right part of the of the slide, you have the delafloxacin. This is a new fluorochilone that has been approved two years ago against staphylococcus. And here you can see that the echo is uh, is 0.016 milligrams per ml, which is really uh, below 
uh, for instance, the echo of, of the ciprofloxacin or the levofloxacin. So uh, there is a problem. Uh, normally, when there is an antibiotic that is trying to be developed, is when we know that the uh, compound interact with the target that, uh, that we know is active uh, for this compound, for instance, the ribosome or the gyrase in the, in, the, in the DNA of the bacteria, but the uh, uh, MIC that we obtain is very high. And normally, this is because there is no penetration of the molecule inside the bacteria. There's a very nice uh, article, a very recent uh, one, that tried to uh, discuss this issue. And this is uh, trying to avoid this with three different issues. Just to introduce a, a ionizable nitrogen in the molecule. Also to enhance what they, they call the globality. This is a modification of the structure of the compound to interact with the bacteria and also to have a rigid structure. If the compound has, has all these three, uh, these three characteristics, the MIC will be lower than the initial compound that we will try to develop. Here you can see also this example with this one uh, compound, the uh, 6DNM NH3. And here you can see in the line related with that, that the MIC are below that the one that we have previously for this, uh, for this uh, description of this, uh, of this uh, antibiotic. Here you have another one that has been, uh, that has been published very recently also, the Fabimicin. The Fabimicin is a F FAB1 inhibitor, that this is enzyme catal catalyzing the rate determining step in bacterial, bactericidal, bacterial fatty acid biosynthesis. And here you can see that the compound is a, a derivative for a, a, a compound that were declared as a lead compound, but there was a modification in the structure of them, also to introducing this uh, previously named group. And here you can see that also the MIC was lower than the one that we have previously in the case of the, uh, of the uh, uh, lead compounds that were previously declared. Also, we know, as uh, previously said, that the MIC is not a very exact or precise uh, value, and this is because there is a, a, a variability when we determine the, the MIC. This is recognized in the ISO document that uh, there is the, the description on how uh, the MIC has to be calculated and is it, it is admitted that at least to fall dilution in the, uh, in the evaluate that we are going to obtain. So it can be the MIC, uh, the upper dilution of the uh, MIC, and the lower dilution of this MIC. And this is because uh, we are using microorganisms. We are using also different compounds, different media to study this MIC. And this is affected by the pH condition, the supplements, the inoculum preparation, the atmosphere, the incubation temperature, the time of incubation, and also the reading of the, this MIC. And also, there is also what we call the biological variation, which is the variability between the different strains. This is well recognized in different studies. You can have the reference below. Some of them were published by the group of Johan Mouton. And here they uh, understand that the intralaboratory variability is lower than one logan, one dilution. But we could compare isolates in the different laboratories. This is a higher value that can be even higher than the one that we have seen in the intralaboratory variation. Here you have some example from my group when we uh, develop uh, and trying to introduce this in the in the testing, which is the ozenoxacin. This is a fluoxetine that is used for for skin infections, topical infection in this case. But here, what I want to say is, if you see how uh, is the modification of the pH, how uh, is the modification of this uh, MIC just going up uh, to the uh, to the MIC's values if we increase, uh, for instance, the pH for this uh, uh, media that we are using when we compare with the standard one which is a neutral pH to the study of the compound that is normally the pH that are using in the ISO recommendation. Here you have also another example with the same uh, compound using different inoculum. If we increase the inoculum, we have more bacterial cells in the median. Sometimes we are surprising what we call the mutation rate. This is not the case of this uh, compound, but here 
if we increase from 10 to the 3, 10 to the 5, 2 to the 7, there's a, a shift to the rise in the increase of the MIC. Of the MIC. MIC. So the inoculum preparation when you are studying uh, a, a microorganism uh, against a compound is very important for uh, obtaining the precise MIC that, that we are trying to do. But even we are, when we are testing the so-called quality control strains that we normally do, do in the clinical labs, just, just to control the, the, the media or to control the technique that you are using, we can see a variability in the MIC that we are using. In the upper part of the, of the slide, you can see the, the Staphylococcus aureus, ATCC, uh, 29th to 13 uh, isolates, and the corresponding one with the E. coli. And you can see that in the levofloxacin, there are two dilutions of the variability. This has been done with different media, and with the levofloxacin, is three dilutions. If we go to the orthenoxacin, you can see here that the activity is higher in the, in the gram positive, and probably because there is a, a small modification of the MIC, the MIC is spread in a higher number of dilutions, which is uh, even more important in the case of the E. coli. For instance, this uh, E. coli was not selected for using of the, as a quality control stain or a, a, a strain because of this high variability of the MIC that we were obtaining. Also, and this has been discussed previously, I'm not going to give a lot of details, uh, sometimes we have to add uh, different compounds in the media that we are using for testing the MICs. For instance, oxacillin, we, 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 we add 2% uh, of salts, in the calcium to a physiological concentration because this improved the interaction with the membrane of the phospholipids, uh, the oritamancin, dalbavancin, uh, with polysorbate to prevent the drug binding of plastic surfaces, the phosphomycin because there is a competition of the entry of these uh, compounds through the membrane of the bacteria, and also the cefidrocol, which is challenging to determine this MIC. We need a uh, higher depleted broth to study this uh, compound or to obtain a precise MIC. And also, the MICs are used in the breakpoint, uh, breakpoint setting. This is very, very uh, established by, by UCAS. This is the standard operation procedure that we are using currently now. And these are the different points that we take into account, the formulation, to say the clinical indication. But for the point four to the point nine, there is different, uh, different uh, consideration. And in all of them, the MIC is a relevant value. For instance, the MIC distribution for the echo of determination, the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic uh, data, the modeling of the Monte Carlo simulation. I will uh, see, show you at least one example. Also, the clinical data relating the outcome of the MIC value. We determine the MIC. We know uh, for the clinical trial if there has been a success of a failure, and this is related and also uh, considered with this MIC that we are determining just to understand uh, for the modelization that was uh, previously done in the PKPD study. Uh, this is also included in some document. I take this document for the EMA, the European Medicine Agency. Here, the European Medicine Agency exhort to the pharmaceutical companies when they have a, a, a compound that is going to develop, is going to present to the breakpoint committees. We need uh, MICs, we need distribution. This is done in surveillance study, and here there is a clear uh, determination and a clear recommendation on how this surveillance must be done to have this MIC value that we are using in the uh, setting of the breakpoints. Also, for the PKPD breakpoints, I recommend you this publication. This is also from Johan Mouton, published in Clinical Microorganic Infection, and this is because we, we have to know the PKPD indexes. And here, the PKPD indexes uh, even the area under the curve, the concentration max, maximum uh, under MIC, and also the time above the MIC. We need, again, the MIC to uh, understand these PKPD indices and to develop the PKPD parameters. This is just an example with uh, one compound, the Tetrosolan tasobactam. These are the distribution of this surveillance study. This is a Monte Carlo simulation. We have here the, the target attainment that we have to obtain when we are testing or to, to have uh, this uh, value for, for, the, for the data that we have. And here, because these are uh, beta-lactam antibiotics, 
we need to have a target, a time and, uh, that is the time above the MIC, which can be, for instance, 40%. And here, with this uh, plot, we can understand in the definition of the of the uh, PKPD breakpoints. For instance, we have four enterobacterales for this compound against uh, this uh, group of microorganisms, and also for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That normally there is a shift in the MIC distribution, normally because of the permeability problems that has the compounds to penetrate into the targets of this uh, bacteria. And lastly, uh, we need this uh, just to this correlation. This is just a, an example of this modification for the PKPD target attainment, where there is a, a, a difference in the renal function. This is also an example of the Fetolos and Tasobactan. But despite that there is a this modification in the renal function of the, of the patient and the clearance, again, we need these MIC values for to understanding if we are reaching or not this target attainment when we are developing this compound. And this is the correlation of the MICs with the clinical outcome. Um, similar to this table, you can have uh, different ones in the rational documents of the UCAS webpage. I take this one with the Ceptosol and Tasobactan. And here we have the different cases of an infection that was included in the clinical trial, trials of the development of the drugs. This was Ceptosol and Tasobactan and complicated urinary artery infection. And we plot here the number of isolates that has a, a, an, an eradication rate. This is a test of cure with this compound that has the percentage, including the cases that has been successful in this case with the use of this uh, compound in this uh, complicated urinary infection. I put here a line. Yes, uh, here are the resistant isolates and here are the susceptible isolates. We expect obviously, to have a clinical success when we are comparing this in the site of the susceptible isolates and failure when we are trying to see this one in the resistant ones. Sometimes this is not perfect, but probably because of this variability in the MIC determination, but also in the different consideration of the patient. So in conclusion, what I wanted to tell you is that the MIC is a reference value to define the individual activity and research and development of new antimicrobial, that there is fortunately a consensus of how to determine uh, this MIC. This is the ISO document, that the MIC may fail to define the activity of the antimicrobials when they have problems to penetrate and to reach the target of the compounds, that there is different factors, uh, what we call a side variation in the determination of the MIC that may affect this determination. In some cases, we need specific uh, supplement, supplements uh, to have the precise MICs, MICs and also that during the process of setting breakpoints, mixed uh, or MIC are uses in surveillance studies, in the PKPD studies for the clinical breakpoints, and also in the clinical outcome correlation. And also, I didn't enter on that, but obviously we can recognize with these MICs that also we have a resistant uh, uh, isolates and we can monitor also the development of resistance. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafael. Um, this, is, um, this was a very nice and clear presentation. And uh, with the ending of your uh, presentation, we are now moving into the Q&A session. We already have uh, a few questions which we will soon start looking into. But before doing that, I would, as a quick reminder for the audience, um, uh, say that you can submit your questions um, um, in the same way as shown on the slide. Um, so this uh, it can be done. And I think um, it's also important that you add um, who the question is for. Uh, this would simplify things. Otherwise, I will try to assign them anyway, the way I think it will be best. Um, but please, uh, if you add this, then it might be even easier. Thank you in advance for that. I think we will start with some questions, um, uh, two questions to start with for, um, um, for D. Uh, the first question is, um, uh, as follows. You said that uh, cation adjusted Muller Hinton broth contains a defined content of calcium and magnesium as standard medium. How would you assess a 
possible interaction with, for instance, uh, ciprofloxacin, which reacts with polyvalent cations. Does this have an effect on the activity of the compound? That's what the um, variation of the cations in the in vitro MIC effect is for. Um, actually, the, the cleanest way to do that, if you want to look at very low cations, is to treat the medium first with the Kelex compound. That removes all cations. And then you can add back the calcium and magnesium to define levels to really understand um, how what the effect is. Um, if you don't want to go to that trouble, um, they do sell, uh, for instance, DIFCO sells a non-cation adjusted medium that you add calcium and magnesium to to get up to the standard concentration. So you can use that as well. It, in that case, uh, you should check the label and make sure that the manufacturer did determine the calcium and magnesium, even though they may not have adjusted it um, for AST use. Thank you. Uh, I will let you have one more before we turn to Raphael. So we will do a, a bit back and forth with the questions, I think. Um, the second one for you is, um, I would like to know about the degradation of carbapenems in the preparation of the stock solution, preparation of the plates for freezing at minus 80 degrees Celsius, and then performing the MIC by microdilution in broth. Uh, there is also uh, some other questions to that, but we can start with that part of the question. I mean, uh, carbapenems, particularly imipenem, is kind of famously unstable. Um, so if if your car if you think your carbapenem is similar to imipenem, then you certainly should test uh, fresh stock and freshly made panels versus frozen panels. And freezing panels at minus 80 is typically sufficient for an unstable drug. Um, once it's combined with the Mueller Hitten broth, then it um, it's more stable than if it were just, say, um, the stock solution alone. Uh, and many drugs require a fresh stock solution, so if your stock isn't stable after overnight at four degrees or if it can't be frozen, that's okay. Just be sure to state that it's not stable um, so that people don't uh, have to figure that out for themselves. I hope that answers the question. Yes, let's hope so. There was also the same um, person also asked um, um, if you could also say something about MIC with silver nanoparticles uh, as well as essential oils. Um, I don't know if you have any experience with this. but uh... I, uh, Sadly, I do not have any experience with silver mm -hmm. nanoparticles. Um, essential oils, I would have, we, we've done MICs on many different types of compounds. Um, ultimately, one needs to dilute it in something. So one could try um, using DMSO and getting it into uh, sort of a suspension before diluting into, diluting down to the concentrations you want to test and getting it into a panel. Um, that would be pretty tricky um, to do, but it's possible. Great. Uh, then I will let um, Raphael have two questions. Uh, the first one is on the relationship between the MIC and the MBC um, and whether there is a standardized um, relationship between these values and whether this can be used to determine the validity of MIC and MBC values. So that's a question for Rafael. Uh, well, we have to differentiate. Uh, if, if we want to do this uh, for routine, it's, it's not very practical probably to, this, to do this for routine. Normally, if we have to know if a compound is bactericidal or bacteriostatic, this is the easiest way <laughs> to, to understand of that instead of doing a killing core, because uh, you, you have to do, uh, let's say, more efforts. But for routine, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's reliable or practical to do this in a, in a clinical laboratory, only just to know that, well, there is some option to do 
with the with the serum that you obtain to the patient in a, in a, in another localities this is very classical uh, to to understand the serum bactericidal activity but uh, this determination even has some caveat and it's not really recommended as an as an standard way so finally which i will say is good to know this but not essentially for uh, for choosing the the antimicrobial to treat the patient Thank you, Rafael. Uh, there is also one more uh, for you. Um, this is um, with regards to um, what could be said, um, let's call it an acceptable uh, mutation or resistance rate for an antimicrobial. Obviously, we would want it to be as low as possible, uh, but which rate could be acceptable for clinical use? And is this something that uh, should be assessed? Well, you know, there are some uh, uh, antibiotics that we are using in clinic, which are the cephalosporin against some enterobacterialis, and those that has AMSI uh, beta lactamase, chromosomal beta lactamase, enterobacter cloacae, or, or, or even in, in Pseudomonas erinosa. This is the this is 10 to the 7 more or less, which is not. I, I would like to be 10 to the to 10 to the 10, which is which is uh, probably more adequate. Uh, but but this is also an interesting question for the MIC determination. The inoculum that we are using is below this mutation rate. It's uh, we are using 10 to the 5, and one of the reasons of that is to be sure that we are not surpassing this uh, mutation rate. So we are, we are determining in a susceptible population, we are sure here that we know we don't have, let's say, a lot of mutants, or even we don't have mutants inside the, 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 the inoculum that we are testing. Because otherwise, if, we, if the mutation rate is very high, we, at the end, we will test the uh, MICs of the resistant mutants and not the susceptible population. Thank you. Let's hope that answered the question. And now I think we have a couple more uh, for D. Um, so we have partly one question uh, here about um, um, situations when the microorganism doesn't grow in Mueller-Hinton. What do you suggest to do? Then one should look at Mueller Hinton broth with the 5% lysed horse blood. That typically supports the growth of organisms like Streptococci. Um, Haemophilus influenza also needs um, NADP added. Um, if your organism doesn't grow in either of those, We've actually found that you know, for streptococci, there are some streptococci that may not grow in one brand of Mueller-Hinton broth, but grow in a different brand of Mueller-Hinton broth, since the the formulas are slightly different. So if you're if you're in a R&D lab where you can play around with different brands of Mueller-Hinton broth, try that. Um, ultimately, if you know, if it's a microaerophilic organism, you know, you might try it on blood auger, um, Mueller-Hinton uh, auger with blood to see if it grows better on auger. Um, incubated in CO2, see if it requires CO2 or a microaerophilic environment. It really depends on the organism that you're looking at and what it's been described to um, need for growth. Great. Um, there is also another one for you here um, on the relevance of testing compounds against uh, intracellular forms of bacteria. Um, I don't have a, a huge opinion about that. I mean, obviously, there, there's been a lot of a lot of um, work done with intracellular, you know, the drug being um, depoted inside a macrophage and, and killing the microorganisms um, once it gets in there. I mean, and, and these are things that can certainly be done to help describe the efficacy of the drug. Um, but in terms of 
everyday testing, I think you still need to do mm -hmm. a standard MIC test um, to help the labs understand how to use your drug. Um, I saw Raphael smile at that question, so maybe he has an no. opinion. <laughs> No, because it's, it's a tricky question because we are yeah. entering in that cases that the MIC is not, let's say, a reliable method to determine the activity of the compounds because we are working only with microorganisms. We are not working with cells, with eukaryotic cells. So uh, we, we are not testing this in the in the MIC determination. For that, we need another different approach, which is similar probably if we want to know which is the real activity of the compound. Uh, in biofilm, it's, it's another situation. It's totally different. The determination. Yeah. All right. We will proceed with two questions for Raphael. Um, the first one is about the pH at the site of infection and how this influences susceptibility. And this um, is a listed example with uh, lactic acidosis, but I suppose it could also be. Um, an abscess or another process um, uh, with altered uh, pH. Would you like to comment on that, please? Well, a again, Christian, this is in vivo, in vivo, because when we are testing in vitro, we, we have the neutral, let's say the neutral pH for this determination, which is the standard one way to do. Also, you see the example of the oxenoxacin, if it is affected with the acidic pH or not, because this is uh, for topical uh, topical use, and and we have here slightly higher, uh, slightly lower uh, pH in this in this location, and and mm. obviously this may affect the activity in vivo of the compound. Some of them yes, I think this they is, are increasing uh, the activity, is... and the other one normally is decreasing the activity because of that. Yeah, and this was probably the the uh, what was meant with the question how it would infect in the in vivo situation at the site of infection. Yeah. So, yes, uh, there is also another question for you. Um, this one uh, is, uh, let's see, um, um, it's again one on MBC um, and whether it has any importance in the drug discovery process uh, or whether just the MIC should be considered. Uh, well, normally, normally we prefer the bactericidal uh, compounds because we understand that the the bacteria is killed by the by the the, the bacteria is killed by the antibiotic. Uh, but we know uh, some uh, antibiotics that has been very successful in the development that they are bacteriostatic, uh, so they are not bactericidal. For instance, the linezolid that this is not a, a bactericidal compound. And also, uh, if you want to know exactly this bactericidal or bacteriostatic, you do not only have to test to one single group of microorganisms, because sometimes there is a difference in between gram negatives, also gram positives, and even uh, can be bactericidal and not in enterococci, for instance, if you compare to staphylococci. It is another, uh, another say, characteristic of the compound but you cannot discharge if i think if it is a novel novel uh, antimicrobial with a new target uh, you cannot discharge this antibiotic because this is not a bactericidal antibiotic but you would recommend to test the mbc also in the process yeah. yes yes of course in the process in the process but not the mbc uh, just determining the mic and later the mbc uh, i would like to recommend also uh, what what we call the more standard way to determine the bactericidal, which is the killing killing course. The killing course mm -hmm. probably you you understand better how how is the rate of the disappear of the microorganisms uh, because you are plotting the 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 the, the microorganisms over time. So you will understand better how the drug is killing the the microorganisms. And you can right. test also there different concentration, which is also fine to know. Yes. Then we have a new question for D. Uh, this is uh, when determining disk QC range and disk breakpoints, how do you check the quality of the disks used in these determinations? Mm -hmm. So if the initial testing would be uh, using homemade disks and then testing 
the QC organisms in triplicate over a few days to determine if you get um, consistent uh, diameters of inhibition and that the diameters of the inhibition are, correlate with the content on the disc. Um, for a formal susceptible um, disc diffusion um, study, you would go to um, an external lab and get discs made by a commercial manufacturer who then will um, use the QC organisms that you've supplied and do some broader testing. But in, I mean, initially, with a new compound and no QC ranges, one just needs to compare the data and make sure they're consistent and make sure that the zone is consistent with the concentration of the disc, meaning a lower concentration has a smaller zone and a larger one. Larger concentration, higher concentration has a larger zone. That's ultimately the only way you can really do it. And across multiple, multiple reps of one bug, and if you, your drug has activity against other species, then look at multiple QC strains. Yes, while you're at it, we also received uh, um, a question whether monoclonal antibodies, um, if there's any potential way of testing them in such assays, in MIC assays. Hmm. I mean, we've, I've done, antibody MICs um, and again we we basically um, diluted diluted the antibody preparation in um, media we tested it with and without um, pooled human serum and compared the activities um, the organism that was that was tested was selected to be um, susceptible to that organism. And obviously we use um, unheated, um, unheated serum so that complement was active. Hmm. And the, another part of that question was the size of these uh, very large protein molecules and whether this is, um, is an issue if you want to do it as you described. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one one can try and and see what one gets. I mean, that's that's the the bottom line. Large large molecules usually do well in broth microdilution. Um, mm -hmm. They are terrible in agar or broth. Mm -hmm. I mean, agar or disc. Uh, great. Uh, there was also another question on. Um, time kill assays and whether they can be used to determine if the compound is bactericidal or bacteriostatic. I think you already responded to that, Raphael, but you would, would you like to add something else to this? Uh, no, uh, to not really. Well, this is, no. this is uh, Christian, this is the standard way to do and, and probably mm. the more, let's say, uh, comfortable way of doing just because we are using concentration that we are tested previously with the MIC but obviously there are other other techniques that we can use to to determine the bactericidal or the bacteriostatic effect which is a flow cytometry flow cytometry is not uh, very well introduced in clinical microbiolo microbiology laboratories but but can be also used as as, as just to test this uh, this uh, characteristic of the of the antimicrobial alliance but this is not so standardized, let's say, uh, compared with the killing corpse. Uh, good. We also have another question here now, um, uh, which pertains to ex extracts uh, that could be either microbial derived or plant derived. Any thoughts on how they should be tested? This one is for D again. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, we, we've tested microbial extracts and, and plant extracts. Again, um, it's important to understand is, if it's water soluble versus whether we, or not we need to use DMSO as a solvent and what activity it has, gram positive or gram negative. Then it's, it's certainly possible to, again, do a dilution with Mueller Hinton broth in a uh, micro titer panel. Um, it's important to know the range and we can 
you know, we don't need to know a concentration per se. We could do like a one to one, one to two, one to four dilution of of the liquid. Um, that's certainly possible. Um, and it would give you a, an idea about the activity against um, the organisms tested. Mm. And, and, and probably so let, let me to see to say uh, yeah. Christian here probably the most problematic thing is is to have the compound of the extract the way of preparation of this extract because it's a mixture normally is the way of, of performing that so at the end you have a mixture and and you don't know the 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 quality the the quantity of the active substance there so you you are doing an mic of what so it's, it's difficult it's difficult to define difficult yeah to define. exactly yeah it's very difficult to define all right then there is another one for Raphael um, uh, how do you calculate the dose to be given in an in vivo experiment um, uh, that will achieve a certain concentration um, plasma concentration above the MIC of the compound mm -hmm. how do you uh, determine the dose Yes, this is done later in uh, in animal studies. Animal studies normally is done in mice, and uh, you extrapolate the the mice uh, pharmacokinetics with the human pharmacokinetics. This is a way of doing. Yeah, generally speaking, obviously. Mm -hmm. To work with uh, humanized dosing regimens. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully, but uh, clearly that also may require some pilot experiments to um, to be absolutely sure about how to proceed with this. Um, now I will see if we missed some questions here. Um, I think there were some that were largely overlapping with others. Um, there was one also about screening compounds uh, for quorum sense inhibition. Uh, it's not entirely clear uh, which of these, um, um, what more specifically they were thinking about. Uh, maybe, I don't know if any one of you would like to to comment on that or... Well, um, probably Christian, I, I don't know, but probably it's related to the activity in biofilms. You know, the quorum sensing here is, yeah. is, is quite important. And we have pretty examples, for instance, with acetromycin. One of the difference mm -hmm. when we test acetromycin in, uh, in planktonic uh, growth, which is the normal way of doing the MIC, and we we, we perform that in biofilm, even in Pseudomonas arinosa. Uh, the, the, the MIC, the MIC, let's say, in the, in the biofilm is much lower than the MIC in plantonic. And this is because probably there is also an interaction with this quorum sensing uh, in the Pseudomonas arinosa in biofilms. Hmm. There is also another question for you, Rafael, um, maybe to explain more about the um, breakpoints, uh, there is uh, some confusions on the difference between MICs and breakpoints um, that you might want to uh, comment briefly on. Well, the, the MIC, the MIC uh, or, or the breakpoint, let's say, is an MIC. We are using this MIC, this a concentration, just to have a correlation of, of the success, successful use of the drug in a patient or the failure. If it is success, this correlation with the MIC is susceptible, as we say, the clinical categorization. And if there is a failure, this is at the end of the process of setting breakpoints, is uh, what we call resistant. We have uh, in between then, in the UCAS uh, nomenclature, the susceptible increased exposure, which is uh, in the in the CLA side, the intermediate. We need uh, to 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 export to exposure in a higher way uh, the microorganisms. Uh, to have this successful effect when we are using this uh, this drug, and this is related with the increase of the dose, or because the drug is concentrated in the site of infection, or because we are decreasing the the, the time in between the, the the doses, or because we are using the the drug in a prolonged infusion, if it is a a beta lactam antibiotic. 
but the breakpoint is an MIC that discriminate these uh, these categories, essentially susceptible and resistant. Mm. Hopefully that uh, explained it. Um, I think um, there are also, maybe I can add a few small questions. Um, there was um, presented in your slides, uh, Raphael, um, um, you presented uh, target attainment. Um, mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a bit more on the target attainment and also what are the typical values uh, that you would like to see of target attainment? Uh, yes, when... for a beta lactan, it can yeah. define 30%, 40%, or 50%, depending on the case. And the target attainment for the beta lactan is the, the time above the MIC. So this is the, the target attainment that we have to reach uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, with this PKPD. Uh, points or with this PKPD modelization and, and normally uh, we have to reach 95% of the uh, probability of the target attainment that we have defined previously with this uh, percentage uh, for instance in the time above the MICs. Mm. So we, we normally um, accept that 5% of the patients will not reach the target um, yes. by doing so. And sometimes people also use other values such as 90%, right? And 10% not hitting the target. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to comment on why these values are sometimes different between uh, um, well, across across different susceptibility testing committees and so on. Well, this can be related on, on how you want to be as strict in favor or not, and also because of the understanding of the variability in between the different uh, patients, uh, renal mm -hmm. clearance and, and and volume of distribution of the drug. So it's uh, it's 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 for this consideration essentially on that. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, and I guess um, the um, it could also be debated whether these um, uh, some of the essays uh, that use uh, table values for protein binding versus uh, actually calculating protein binding can also um, have quite a lot of impact on how um, the ultimate conclusions uh, become. Um, I will see if there were some further things on MIC testing, but I think we have more or less covered all of those questions that we uh, received. Um, so if there is anyone now who would like to add, um, there is still some time to add final questions. If anyone has anything more that you feel was not um, properly uh, answered or where you would like a further clarification, then please feel free to, to write that uh, and, um, at the moment so we can have a final look at that as well. Um, is there anything more from anyone? It seems like maybe there are no more uh, questions at this point in time. And I think that means we have come to the end of the Q&A session. Um, I would like to really thank um, everyone who sent questions and comments. Uh, and of course, also a big thanks to the speakers, uh, both for their nice presentations and for responding to uh, all of the uh, questions and with this i would like to hand back the word to astrid many thanks thank all you right. thank you thank you christian uh, for for um, moderating this webinar for the, and the q and a and thank you Dee and rafael for your presentations and obviously for your patience in responding to all these very detailed questions
Um, we, we, if, we have, if we receive more questions after the closing, we might send them to you per email, so you might want to um, keep your eye out for that if you would be so kind. Um, all right, so finally, I wanted to um, alert the audience to the fact that we will soon be announcing more webinars and um, for this please always keep an eye out on our website uh, we, you will also receive newsletters as you have registered for this webinar or we also share this information on twitter and linkedin um, and that's all from my side so thank you everybody for joining and contributing and i hope to see you soon on our next webinar thank you very much thank you Thank you. Bye-bye.